Okay, so church, before Jan comes out, let me tell you a little bit about her. And I mean a little bit, because I don't want to take much time. But Jan Markell is a woman who came to faith in Jesus as uh, a young teen out of a Jewish home. And God has used her with a passion in her heart for the word. She has been a student of the word. And she has been, I think what is the most attractive thing for me, for all of us, is that Jan has a high view of scripture. Which if you listen to her radio program, listen to this now. Her radio program, which airs on over 830 stations across America and in 24 other countries in the world. This is unbelievable for, first of all, a woman to have access into parts of the world where men don't listen to women Bible teachers. She understands her place and position. She's not a pastor. She's a Bible radio commentator, and I would call her a biblical cultural expert. I don't know of anyone that has their finger on the pulse of what's happening in the church and in the world around us like Jan Markell. She is a Deborah in our age and in our culture. And to give you a little snippet of what God has done with this woman, uh, she started, I think, I'm going to be wrong, but I'll be close, somewhere around 2003-ish, she started a prophecy conference. And today, it's the largest prophecy conference in North America. I don't know, but if it's not the largest prophecy conference in the world. La listen, last year, the church that hosted, they were so fed up with the crowds that they limited it to, I think, 4,300 people because the previous years, over 6,000 people would show up and it'd create a big problem. There's a woman for this age to speak to the church and analyze what's going on in the world. So give a warm welcome to one of my great heroes, Jan Markell. Here we go. Amazing. <laughs> well, Jan, um, these people know that I have said often that I view you as our modern day Deborah, and I say that because of your courage. De uh, Deborah stood for the truth, she heard the word from God, and Deborah went out and fought battles. And Jan Markell is that personality in our culture, in our age. And, but let me tell you something. If you get an invitation from Jan Markell to speak at her conference, it is, it is a serious and reverent thing. And so um, it's just an amazing thing. And so Jan, we're going to get right into this. And what I would like uh, you to kind of go down maybe from memories just the other day. By the way, if you guys do not get Jan's email, you need to get it. Can you tell us how to get that for those who don't get it? It's oliveTreeViews.org, and before we get going, I, I, look, I got to say, you folks, you know you're blessed, okay, not because of me, but because of this wonderful pastor you have. And, but last fall, he was with, all, with me in 2015 as well, and, and you know, people in the hotels, that, that we had about 55 states, Canadian provinces, and foreign countries represented last September, and they look at your pastor as America's pastor. I said that from the platform, so it's double emphasis, but again, you're blessed, you're so blessed, because the church today has kind of gone haywire, okay, not this one, um, but a lot of churches have gone haywire, and, and for a hundred reasons, and we can get into it later, but when you've got a pastor who's preaching the truth, who loves the Lord, and who loves you, I know you, you know what I'm talking about, and you know you are blessed. So thank You're very you for kind. having me. Thank you. But you didn't give them the address. I didn't. I got so <laughs> caught up in what I was You're too kind. OliveTreeViews.org. Sign up for the e-alerts, and I think we're going to talk about the one I put out a couple days yes. ago. Uh, kind of analyzing 2018 from a prophetic perspective, and I'll... I'll let you drive the bus and I'll just go along. Before we do that, olivetreeviews.com. <laughs> org. Dot org. 
plural, all of three views. Views uh, with an S. Make sure you start getting that. I'm telling you, it's awesome. And you're going to get the latest from all around the world of what's going on from a biblical perspective. That's what's great about what Jam puts out. It's safe. It's safe. And I love that. So just recently, one of those emails that you sent out to us gave, I think it was a list of 10 regarding the closeout of 2018. And you, re, you went down the list of things that you felt strong that, um, that God showed you for, if you had to reduce 2018 down to 10 top issues, yep. you listed them. Can you just kind of... Well, I don't have them in front of me. I'll, you know, we'll go by, we'll, we'll kind of go by up. memory here and everything. But um, Jack, I think what, what I would start with, just to get kind of the conversation rolling, and I, I think you would agree that, and I happen to... To, to list this issue as number one, and, and that would be um, the issue of globalism, yep. the one world system that is just Huge. dying to get birthed. And right now, one person is holding it back, and, and this isn't a time... Go ahead we're, and say it. we're, it's we're, true. We're not here to, to, to be uh, cheerleaders tonight for, uh, for Donald Trump and all that. I'm thankful that he's in office. I'm thankful he's in office, and and I have a little bit of insight behind that. But Donald Trump has said, and particularly he said it again in September at the UN. He said it the previous September at the UN. He said, "Folks, I am not a globalist. I am a nationalist." Now that threw, yes. quite frankly, that threw the globalists a curveball all the way back in 2016. But they didn't think they were going to lose in 2016. That's a fact. Yeah. And so they thought, okay, he's a nationalist, big deal, it doesn't matter, we don't like it, but he's not going to win. Well, he wins. Yeah. Okay, so now they've got a huge problem on their hands, and this whole globalist agenda, which I believe is, is being birthed in Europe, which I believe yes. is going to blossom in Europe, in which right now Europe's in chaos, the yellow jacket re revolt and all of that, um, I believe the... Uh, Holy Roman, the ancient Roman Empire, the revived mm -hmm. Roman Empire is going to come out of Europe. I believe the Antichrist will come up out of Europe. I believe there are some suspicious characters over there not naming the Antichrist. Okay, I don't think that's real profitable. Keep your eyes on Emmanuel Macron. He's extremely suspicious. Okay, I, listen, I have to, I have to, I have to say something. Can okay. some, no, can someone go, guys, in the, yeah. Can someone go to my, the, the uh, stage room, the blue room back there? And there's a, uh, where the microphones are at, there is a uh, Newsweek or uh, uh, Economist. Economist. Can magazine. someone bring that out? Yeah. If you can hear me? It's I, really good. In, in light of what she just said, you might yeah. say, well, that, that's crazy. <laughs> wow, Steve. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Pastor Steve Hurlbert. <laughs> okay, wow. I. This guy, okay, can you guys see this? I, yeah. She's talking about, first of all, let's pause. She's talking about globalism. Now, some of you, I don't know, but maybe some of you in here are not aware of, what's the big deal about globalism, especially the young generation? You think it's cool. And so Trump comes on his campaign with this ridiculous slogan, make America great again. And everybody laughed. But remember something, the God of Daniel says in the book of Daniel that God has established the boundaries of nations and their dwellings within their places. Remember that. The other thing is this, that a, a unified world uh, would not go well because that means man has ultimate control. And when you have somebody like a Donald Trump who comes up and is a nationalist, People are going to yell and scream about this, but listen, when push comes to shove, everyone's a nationalist to some degree. But if you're not a nationalist, you're a globalist. For example, nationalism has now exploded again in Brazil. Look, can you guys see this? The Economist, Europe's, did you see that? <coughs> Europe's savior. Europe's now, savior. Want to talk about that? Well, at the same time, let's keep in mind that his popularity at home is completely destroyed. Yeah, he's nobody at home. He's nobody in France. I mean, they'd like to throw the bum out, but the point is, he's rising. Angela Merkel is sinking in popularity in, well, she's, she's retiring, finally, and she's, she, that's because she was sinking in popularity in Europe and Germany, 
And this young man stepped up in 2017. I believe he's the ultimate pick of the globalists. I'm not so, I think the globalists put him in power to test the waters. In this case, literally, he's walking on water. Yeah, they do have that. Yeah. And, and I think they wanted to test the waters with him. Could they mold him into a European leader and maybe eventually a world leader? Again, this is a lot of speculation. The point is, there's a war right now between nationalism, with Donald Trump leading that because he's the arch ultimate nationalist, Donald Trump, and then the world's globalists who are literally all over the world, but I believe their headquarters would be Europe. And this is a man, just keep your eyes on him. That's yes. all I'm saying. All I'm saying, because Macron. again, trying to name the Antichrist, you know, it's, it's kind of... Uh, By the way, what's his first name? Emmanuel. What's his first name Emmanuel. again? Emmanuel. Oh, yes, and that can all change. In 2020, that can change. 2024, that can change. If we get a globalist in office as president. Um, again, Hillary Clinton, I, I'm sorry, yeah. she was the arch globalist. Clinton Global Initiative, all right? How much yeah. more obvious? Clinton Global Initiative. So that was their pick. She was their pick for 2016 to then soar and take the whole world eventually. She probably wouldn't have done it, but at least take it in that one world direction. And God had other ideas, okay? He had other ideas. He said, not quite yet. <laughs> not yet. Not yet. Not It'll yet. happen, but not yet. And it will happen eventually. The Bible tells us that in the last days, she mentions three times tonight the revised uh, Roman Revi Empire. This has to be, by the way. That's, this is not Jan's uh, interpretation. This is what the Bible says that the end times, it says that the fourth global ruling power will come back and it's represented in Daniel's image of the statue having 10 toes. And it tells you that the 10 toes represent 10 kings or 10 horns. And the Bible makes it clear that out of this 10 group leadership, an interesting verbiage, it says out of the 10, that, that, that means within their sway on the world, an 11th person is going to rise up from the midst of them. Yeah. It almost makes it sound like he sneaks in among the 10. And it says that he begins softly. He's an insignificant one. And he rises by his genius. Yeah. It says that he's going to deceive the world with peace and prosperity. And that he will single out four specific leaders of the 10. And he will subdue them by intrigue, Daniel says, and he will arise to be the world leader from what? From the two legs of the image of Daniel's statue and his vision. And what were the two legs? We don't even have to guess. The two legs were the, le were the east and the west flanks of the Roman Empire. And the Bible makes it very, very clear. Daniel chapter, my goodness, Daniel 2, yeah. 7... 8 and 11, I believe it is. You can read that later, but here's the amazing thing. Jan's talking about headline news where Europe's looking for a leader. Uh, Jack, he wants, he wants a 10-nation confederacy. I he didn't put know that. that. He put that idea of uh, 10 nations that would answer to him. He also wants, um, he, told, he has told Donald Trump, if you can't get your Middle East peace, in peace initiative through, soon, because Donald Trump's been promising it for a long time. If you don't hurry up, I will do it. I will do it. So again, you know, let's be careful. I mean, what we're saying, I think it's serious, but let's be careful. Let's err on the side of being conservative. <coughs> when, when, I mean, we could talk false prophet. Look, my, one of the other points, I'm, trying to, I'm just trying to conserve time. Here. Oh, we one have of, a lot of time, though. One of the other, point, one of the, uh, other 10 points that I feel, because what I wrote about and what we're talking about are 10 issues in 2018, and that is a chaos in the Vatican. And I mean, the, the Vatican has been so embarrassed and humiliated because this last year it's all come out. Yeah. And what does Pope Francis do? He looks the other way and talks about global warming and talks about uh, socialism and talks about things majoring in minors while his, the, the Catholic Church has just fallen apart, but I think that's important to watch. I think the fact that the Vatican is in chaos, I personally believe a false prophet is going to be a pope. Is it Pope Francis? I don't know. 
I think he's 82 or 83 years old. We need to get the show on the road. I mean, we can't wait forever. I'm not going to have a whole lot of steam in me when I'm 82 or 83. I'm not there yet, Jack. I know, you're I know you yet. wonder how old I am, but I'm not there I'm yet. Not, I never wondered, and I won't ask. Oh, well, I, you sort of am, were wondering one day. That's okay. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, all I'm saying is, I, I think we need to be watching the Vatican, and I think we need to see that there's instability in the Vatican, and that could play into this kind of a role that we're talking about here. And having said all that, when we start trying to pin the tail on antichrists and false prophets, we got to be really careful right. because it's rec it can be reckless, it can be dangerous, and when we're proven wrong, we got egg in our face and the unbelieving world laughs at us. Mm -hmm. Therefore, let's err on the side of conservatism now that we've spent 15 minutes on this. One more thing on this topic, though. Yeah. Could, it be, could it be that the sincere, sincere religious Catholic is now so disillusioned? Yes, I hear from them. And they are beginning to somewhat panic, and I mean this in a good way, and they're now wondering, wait a minute, this is not, this is not the church that I think Jesus died for, and maybe, maybe we're about to see an incredible, as the Lord says, come out from among yes. them and be separate. What if there's an, a massive wave of salvation to the disillusioned Catholics around the world? I'm praying for that. I'm praying for that. Yeah, I've, I've heard from some, I get some emails, and, and some are asking that, yeah. Uh, what, what's, what's two? What's next? Yeah, we don't have to go in the order of your email, but we can... <sighs> okay, well, um, again, I sent ten, uh, <laughs> 10 things that I think are... You know, we could talk about 110 things. There's so much has happened in the last 12 months. Um, I think, obviously, Israel turning 70 is huge. It's a huge thing. It's a huge thing. And then, then the embassy has moved on the same day. Um, I, I, it says in Psalm 90 that a generation is 70 years. I know it says other things other places, but it says it's 70 years. Okay, um, Jesus says in Matthew 24, we see the various things happen. In the last day scenario, the generation that sees the fig tree yes. blossom, that generation will, I believe we are the generation that will see the return of the Lord in the rapture. Not the second coming. We, we miss out on all that. We come back with Amen. him in the second coming. Amen. But I, I really believe we're the generation. I know Amir feels this way so strongly. Um, Israel is the, it's God's clock. The, set, the minute hand is Jerusalem. The second hand, I believe, is the Temple Mount. And Which is being discussed in Art of, and the Absolutely. And I think one of the other 10 significant happenings of 2018... <laughs> Have you seen the focus on the what we would call the tribulation temple? We're never going to see it. The Antichrist will... Do you guys know what she's talking about? Have you seen that? We had the Sanhedrin invite 70 nations. There's that, na that number again. How long is Daniel's 70th week? Okay, so the Sanhedrin invites 70 nations in December, December 10th, to come in and dedicate the altar in the tribulation temple. They don't call it that. No. No, but think about it. The Sanhedrin. When's the last time you read about the Sanhedrin people? Yeah. In your Bibles. Okay, if there's a skeptic in the house, listen up. We're talking about Israel. The only nation in the history of mankind that ceased to be a nation and came back to be a nation again. Just as God said it would happen in one day, book of Isaiah. On top of the fact that the Bible tells us, and we know this from Matthew 25, Mark 13, Luke 21. Yeah. Right? And 2 Thessalonians 2, that there will be a temple in Jerusalem during the tribulation. How do we know this? 2 Thessalonians 2, 2 tells us, chapter 2, tells us that the son of perdition, the Antichrist, will declare himself to be God in that temple. Jesus said it in Matthew 24 that when you, the Jews who live in Jerusalem, Judea, in this region, when you see that happening, come down from your housetops. Don't even go back inside of your house to get your jacket. Run. If you're in the field, drop your tools and run. When you see the abomination of desolation, standing in the place where it ought not to stand. And friends, we're talking right now of a Sanhedrin 
that have the implements, That's right. the golden menorah, That's right. the bronze basin, all of the utensils based upon the book of Leviticus, they've made them all. Pure silver, those things that are supposed to be silver, those things that are wood overlaid with gold, they're done, they're made, it's all done. They have found numerous now red heifers. That's right. You say, what, a red heifer, who cares? You can't sanctify those tools according to the Bible without the ashes of a red heifer. And for the first time in a couple thousand years, a red heifer and several ones since have been uh, born and Israel has them. You say, well, I don't believe that. You don't have to believe it. They do. Right. And they do. And so this is an amazing alignment of yeah, things. Yeah, it's an alignment. It's a convergence. And um, I think if there's one word that would summarize what we're talking about, it would be the word convergence, the convergence of so many things. And, you know, I mean, not to go overboard on signs, 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 but... The Bible tells us to watch the signs. The, the, the people of Jesus' first coming missed the signs, so many of them. And the exhortation to us is, hey, don't do that a second time. So I just think we should be uh, watching for his appearing. And one of the way we, ways we watch for his appearing is some of the things the Bible outlined would happen. And this temple talk is very significant, very significant even though it has nothing to do with us, right. nothing to That's do with right. us, we'll never see it. Amen. The Antichrist will go into it, and halfway through the tribulation, he'll turn on the Jews. He'll have been their friend for, for a short season. He'll probably have allowed them to build that third temple, which doesn't exist right now. Mm -hmm. All these preparations coming for a temple that doesn't exist. <coughs> they think it's going to exist soon. It is, but the Antichrist will be in charge, and halfway through, he turns on them, and then comes the scenario where they're having to flee, to flee probably to Petra. So all I'm saying, all we're talking about here, is we need to be watching this as extremely intriguing times that now we've got temple talk going on. Like Jack, sa Jack says, a, a red heifer was born in Israel in August, it's perfect. Problem is, if it gets three white hairs, it's, it's yeah. not perfect. And all the others get those white hairs. They're hoping the one that was born in August won't, and that that'll be the perfect heifer. Um, so, I mean, these are incredible times. And you know what? Here's what's so cool about these. We get it. 95% mm -hmm. of the world, not, not only do they not get it, they don't care. Did you see the They're, world? Yeah, the world. I thought you were talking about the church. And then the church. Well, yeah. <laughs> I mean, a great, a great we, majority of the church doesn't care. We can stick to the church. 95% of the church does not care, does not get it. Not that they're, I'm not saying they're majoring in minors. The world is. But the church is majoring in other things, not this. And I think that's the tragedy of my lifetime. And I know some others who feel the same, Jack. Well, Jan, you, um, you minister to an online audience... It just might be that you are the teacher. You are the Priscilla from the book of Acts to a generation of viewers and listeners on your program that is, is staggering in numbers. And can you tell the people what you're hearing? And I got a little sample of it. I was not prepared, quite frankly. Okay. When I showed up in Minneapolis, I was not prepared to meet people uh, starving to death. Yeah, and that's a good way of putting it. Share with them what you yeah. hear. They're starving to death. They're dying of hunger and thirst. And that's why I said here half an hour ago, you know, be so thankful you folks have a, you have a church home. Uh, because there are a lot of ministries, ministry leaders, I can only, I'll only refer to myself, but I hear from others that, that are hearing on a regular basis, I've lost my church, my church has changed on me, my church is teaching replacement theology, or, or suddenly we're into uh, the emergent church, or suddenly we're into church growth tactics, suddenly uh, we're into, um, you know, contemporary music's fine, no, I don't have any, nobody has any issues, 
with contemporary music until you have to start handing out earplugs before anybody can come into the sanctuary, and that's happening almost everywhere. Pulpits not giving heed to sound doctrine. And in some cases, literally the doctrine of demons coming yep. into the church. Yes. Literally the doctrine of demons. Now, I'm going to refrain from name and places and movements and things like that, but I've tried to do some programming on some of, I'll just say this much, for instance, on the New Apostolic Reformation yep. and some of the crazy things going on there, and it's not of God. Share with them, because I some there's no doubt in my mind, Jan, that someone listening or Okay. It's here right now. Would know someone who's in the apostolic movement of today. What are some of the things that they're doing in their move in their movement? Grave soaking. Explain that. <clears throat> the new apostolic reformation, and they're first of all, they're a good people in it, and they're a good people getting caught up in it, and they're innocent and they're naive and they're being hurt. Um, about eight months ago, in a church I was attending. A couple came up to me and took me aside and said, uh, Jan, thank you for kind of exposing a little bit this new apostolic reformation. They said, our daughter um, was sort of kidnapped, not literally, but emotionally yeah. and psychologically and spiritually. She was kidnapped by Bethel Church, Redding, California. Mm -hmm. She willingly went out there and then... She got involved in sozo counseling, which brainwashed her, and was convinced that, uh, Caitlin was convinced that her parents had abused her. Never happened, I know them. They're the most wonderful people you could ever meet. And as we speak, they're so devastated and heartbroken after eight years of missing their daughter, okay? But it started out very harmlessly, very innocently, and. Caitlin went off to Bethel Church Reading, and you get caught up in the signs, the wonders, the miracles, the supposed everyone should be healed and everyone can be healed, and pretty soon, uh, and some of the extreme of this, some of the extreme of this would be some of the grave soaking, and uh, you can look that, you can Google that and see pictures of it. You, you lay on the grave of a, a departed saint, any, any, maybe recently departed, just lay on the grave and the uh, spirit of that dead person will supposedly come into you through the grave. It's called grave soaking. Um, and this is one of the things they do. And they're ex excessive into signs, wonders, miracles. I believe in miracles. And folks, hey, hold on. I've been healed. I believe in healing. Okay? Amen. I believe in healing. Yeah, amen. Not putting that down. I wouldn't, I thank God, I wouldn't be here if I hadn't been healed in 2000. So, um, but, but when you take that too far, when you take all of that too far, then you start going into uh, the ab aberrations of all That's of it. Right. Aberrations of all of it. You know, I don't know if you guys know this. Um, I, I don't know if you're familiar with that term, grave soaking, um, but you... You are familiar with some names. I probably shouldn't say them because they'll sue me. I'm not <laughs> stupid. But there's certain ministers that kind of travel together in a group. They minister together in a group. Uh, I don't know why, but they're all, they all seem to be in Texas. And, and uh, what else? Texas. Maybe Oklahoma, a couple of them. But they got this thing, and it's, they've been around a long time. And you, you, you can search hard. Don't use the term grave soaking. They used a different term 25 years ago. But some of the guys that you can turn on TV, and your TV this coming Sunday, you can turn them on your television set. They have gone to the grave sites of Dwight L. Moody, for example, yeah. they, who's great, don't get me wrong. Yeah. Dwight L. Moody, he would have popped. If Moody would have been there, he would have jumped up and knocked them out for doing yeah. this. But, would have. <laughs> but uh, one, one very famous guy uh, went and laid on the top of the grave of um, Catherine Coleman. Coleman. And he said that he's felt her spirit come into him and that his ministry since then has had tremendous power. And you can, you can turn him on on Sunday morning. 
And folks, this is the doctrine of demons. I'm That's sorry. doctrines of demons. This is the doctrine of demons. You don't, you don't want to go down this path. You don't. But you say, Jack, Jan, those are famous people. Uh-huh. The Bible says, men from among yourselves will come out of you. There'll be deceivers in the last days. How do you think they're going to deceive? Because they're, they're going, they would have won us over in some way, shape, or form in, in the first place. Uh, this is dangerous stuff. And... Um, so what she's saying, you say, well, I've never heard of such a thing. That can't be real. This has been going on for a long time. And some of these guys cite, they use this as a pathetic example, St really stupid example. Do you remember when uh, the young man died uh, and Elijah <coughs> laid on top of the body and the body arose from the dead? That's how they justify their, mm -hmm. their uh, you know, acts, but... This is absolutely insane. But it answers to this issue. Why? Why would such actions draw such crowds? Yeah. Because we live in a, an age that is hyper for spiritual, spirituality and spiritism. And so, Jan, can you talk to us about the things that you see, the stuff that you've analyzed regarding the craving for spiritual things that we're seeing right now in the world. Yeah, uh, well, the supernatural, yeah. you mean good and bad? Sure. I mean, uh, one of the things, of the 10 points I have, uh, tragically, that I've seen escalate off the chart um, would be uh, the rise of evil, supernatural evil. Um, oh, my, I've got some pictures that I use as il il illustrations, um, and I, unfortunately, we, we're not real visual tonight, but the, the rise of evil is just absolutely staggering. Do you know that last October 31st, Halloween, there were tens of thousands of churches all across America that were doing some form of activity, I don't want to say in honor of Halloween, but trying to have the dancing skeletons on the platform. I've got pictures of it. There's videos of it online. It's unbelievable. I mean, again, these are the literal doctrine of demons that we should be fleeing from. What does the Bible say about, about evil and particularly um, keeping children away from things like this? And yet here we have churches that are celebrating it. Um, there's a new line of uh, Disney clothing called, um, uh, it's just children's clothing. Evil never looks so good is, is how, yeah. they, how they market it. So evil is being glorified, and, and I think this is one of the 10 most stunning things to happen in, in the last, obviously it's been going on for decades, but it's just sort of blossomed in this last year. <coughs> when we have this, the, the tragic shootings, mm -hmm. how often have you heard the, the killer say, I heard voices telling me to do oh, it? Yeah. And you know why it's happening? Satan knows his days are numbered, and so he's picking up steam, and he's trying to make a last hurrah. And uh, we can push back. And we can stop, as the church, we can stop that. We, we can at least slow it down. And we need, but we need to be aware that it's going on. We need to be aware that it's going on. Um, and it, the other thing related to this, not so much doctrine of demons and things like that, Jack, but is the apostasy raging yes. through our church today. Talk about and it. that yes. is heartbreaking. It is just heartbreaking. Um, so, and I've already touched on, on a couple of the issues that's going on here, but the difficulty for people to find a church with sound doctrine. That's why they turn to you. They're turning to uh, guys like Amir, Pastor J.D. Farag, uh, some others as well, but um, they keep referring to you three. I, almost every other email I get, it's referring to you three. And the fact that the greatest news there is and the greatest hope there is, that's the blessed hope, mm -hmm has been silenced in the pulpit. This is across the board, at least in the Western church, across the board, the news that the king is coming has been <clears throat> deemed as um, irrelevant, out of date, unpopular, will keep folks away. Uh, we have a building program that lasts 10 years, and you're telling me Jesus is coming next oh, that's week? that's hilarious. Uh, we can't, we, we can't, We've got to focus on our building program. So, I mean, you, there's a hundred reasons <laughs> pastors don't feel qualified. They don't feel perhaps adequately taught in seminary. They just they simply haven't figured out which uh, which theology 
Is it amillennialism? Is it premillennialism? Is it pre-trib? Is it mid-trib? Oh, yeah. Is it pre-wrath? Is it post-trib? Uh, what is it? We haven't quite figured it out, so they stay away from it. I mean, thank God for Calvary Chapel. Thank God for Calvary Chapel. You guys, um, I was telling Janet dinner tonight, I wish that we could have had a camera this last Sunday uh, backstage. You know, Dr. Heinsohn wasn't, help, wasn't well, so he, he honestly tried to avoid as many people as he could because he was sick. Uh, he was so kind, he gave me his <laughs> sickness. <laughs> but that was a gem back there. If we could have recorded what he was talking about, because it's exactly what Jan just said a moment ago. He was telling me, he said, Jack, um, Moody, Liberty, Multnomah, Dallas, DTS, Dallas Theological Seminary, all of the pastoral classes, all of them, of these universities, are rapidly declining. They can't get enough students to fill up the classes with the professors for the first time in American history for ministry. He said, people don't care. People don't care. And I said, why is that? He says, because people, students are coming from churches that are not, listen to this, and she said it a moment ago, they're not serious about the return of Jesus Christ, so they have no, what's the word, urgency to preach the word and go to Africa and go to, uh, you know, Zimbabwe and go to California and preach the gospel to the lost <laughs> because, he said, and he, he did the pathology of it, because the churches are not teaching Bible prophecy. He goes, that's always the key. That when Bible prophecy is not being taught in a church, a church goes lazy, apathetic, and becomes what you're passionate to fight, a social church. It becomes nothing more than a moral gathering, a membership. And he said, when you lose the desire or the understanding, Jesus could come back today, let's go preach. Jesus could come back today, let's go help the homeless. And you know how much discipline it takes? I love what she said a moment ago. Do you know how hard it is to believe that Jesus Christ is coming back any moment and then, by the Holy Spirit, prepare for the next 25 years? Think about it. That's discipline. You know what that's called? Occupying till he comes. You've got to plan for the future, but you need to expect, like Paul the Apostle, for Jesus to return any moment. That's a tough way to live. That is a discipline. Yeah. And yet, all of us are called to live that kind of a Christian life. You go to work, you pay your bills, you raise your kids in Jesus, you plan for their future. Listen, mom and dad, you save money for your kids. That's what the Bible says. Don't live off your kids. You're supposed to fuel your kids in the future. Yet, at the same time, be ready for the Lord's return. That takes discipline. But the social, the social gospel yeah. world we're living in is just creating a nothingness church. And uh, I'm going to share something. I'm yeah, not sure. I don't think I've ahead. ever shared this publicly, you guys. The Family Research Council, prior to the second election of Barack Obama, one of his attorneys had a brother who was a friend of Family Research Council. This is behind the door stuff, behind the scenes stuff. He never got around to it because there were too many issues. God, God delayed and derailed Barack Obama in the second term. His second term, Barack Obama was going to launch a community awareness outreach across the United States in every city that would take up the challenge to host a community outreach to take away graffiti, fix pe old people's fences and homes. Are you listening to me, everybody? It was going to be at 10 o'clock in the morning, once a week. I'll give you one guess as to what day of the week it was going to be. Yeah. Who needs church? Every millennial would have flocked to that because it makes you feel good, you're doing something, and Barack Obama's got his thumbs up to it. And every time, this, you don't know this, every time behind the scenes that he was getting ready to launch it, some crisis came up and he was derailed from it. That was the hand of God. How do I know this? By direct connection with the Family Research Council 
and Democrats working with Barack Obama that were informing Tony Perkins of what was coming. Guess what? When I heard that, I got a cold chill down my spine because there ain't a church on the planet that can compete with that kind of Sunday morning activity. Mm. And it would have gone over like gangbusters, right? Think of that. That's a doctrine of a demon yeah. in a way, yeah? Well, I, social justice has come in to the church uh, like a tornado. It mm. has just come in, swept in, and the kind of things you're talking about, the um, doing good things, doing good works, social justice, uh, cause of the immigrants, all those kinds of issues have taken over the evangelical church. Uh, I'm not going to get into naming names, but I mean, it is of crisis proportion. Yes. It's of crisis proportion. And I'm hearing from pastors, all denominations, but heavily, um, very solid denominations, certainly at one time, and some individual churches, very solid at one time, that are caving to the social cry of social justice. We have to do good. Well, um, that, but then that's what gets in the pulpit. That becomes the purpose, even more so than winning uh, lost souls, it would be yep. making room for the immigrant instead of, that would be the focus, instead of winning the lost. So um, it's, it's a serious, and I think it's an end time thing, I really do. I think it's all yes. a part of the um, it's part of not giving heed to sound doctrine. That's right. For all, that, that's one of the most prominent end time signs is, the, is apostasy. Jesus talked about that more than almost anything else. The writers of the New Testament talked about that almost more than anything else, putting it in a last day's context. So that's sort of the good side, is that it's another sign, it's another herald of his coming. It's a little bit like when we watch really dark headlines, so hard to watch. If we can put it into a context of uh, the, the headlines are a herald of his coming, it makes them a little more bearable. And that's another sign of the 10 that I had. And that is some of, and you folks are living witnesses to the escalation of the birth pangs. And the birth pangs really, a lot of this blossoms in the tribulation, a lot of it. Yeah. Some of the things we're talking about blossom. In the, but if they're in the tribulation and they're casting a shadow now, it's warning signs for us. And um, look, I've heard from your fire victims. I featured one on air last weekend, um, Julie Braden told her story, she lived in paradise, mm -hmm. and you know paradise is gone, you know that. Um, she and her husband and her dog made it out, and um, some of the Calvary chapels are stepping up to help a lot of the people there, but her story, Jack, it was just heartbreaking. Then I heard from a survivor of Malibu fires as well, and as awful as they were, and they were unspeakable, you know what, the tribulation is gonna oh be so much worse Save your, get your loved ones saved soon so that they can, <laughs> so they can av avoid this because what's coming, church will be gone, but what's coming is unspeakable. Just read Revelation, yeah. read the seals, the bowls, the judgments, the vials, the plagues that, that are coming upon this earth while the, the church is enjoying heaven for those seven years. Um, but we have got to, be winning the loss while there is time. Because when you see, well, you just take the little microcosm of what happened, say, in paradise, and you apply that to the whole world. Just think about that for a moment. It's unthinkable. That's right. It's unthinkable. If you've got someone you love, hey, that's unthinkable. That's right. Occupy until I come. That's, and that's one of the ways we occupy is to win the loss while there's time. If there's anything you remember from the two of us tonight, Please remember that time is so short. It is so short. God's sending one warning signal after another, after another, after another. Time is short. Make good use of it, please. I am, I'm listening to her right now, and I remember when Lisa and I were married, and uh, we didn't have kids yet, and we, when we heard things like this, we would, as a young couple, should we have kids? Should we, and you know, you go through this. Should we, should we have kids? Should we try to get a house? I mean, Laura can come back. And then the, just the freedom that what Jan just said a moment ago, occupy till I come. Just one foot in front of another, plan on living your life, go for it. 
and uh, live, live big for Jesus. Mr. Pastor, I'm just now enrolling into law school. Go for it. Be the best lawyer in the world. We need godly lawyers and doctors and moms and dads. Go for it. But listen, don't let anyone tell you, like they accuse Jan and I of, oh, you're just, you're just uh, telling people to go sit on a roof and wear their bed sheet and look up and wait for Jesus. No, we're not. No. Only a lunatic would do that. Okay? No, no, no. And so it should cause you. Now look, you, you need, and that's why we have, for example, the call ministry for you to be trained in, evangelism. But if you don't want to do that, at the very least, can you at least, and this goes to everyone who's viewing right now, we know we'll get hundreds of thousands of views from tonight. If you, if you can't share the gospel with someone, I don't know why you can't, I know it's terrifying, but if you can't do it, can you at least invite them with you to a Bible teaching church? So I'm too scared to share the gospel. Okay, look, we'll deal with that later. In the meantime, invite your unsaved friend to church. Well, what if they don't like it? It's not your business. Well, what if the message, it's not your business. Leave it up to God. Let him, let him take care of that, okay? That's, you're just to invite them. So um, I'm gonna ask Jan one more thing, but in this question, I'm gonna ask, Joel, where are you? Are you around? Joel, so Joel's going to hold the microphone, and um, if you want to ask Jan a question, here's what we're going to do for time's sake. We're going to, you're going to ask your question, and then you're going to get out of the way, and, and she's going to answer, and uh, this is not a time for you to preach or to do anything. You ask the question, and um, remember, the more educated you are, the fewer words you can ask the question, so no pressure, but that's the pressure. Jan, um, where do you see right now with what's going on? There's, there's a, do you, th well, I already know the answer to that, but right now, Benjamin Netanyahu and Trump yeah. are both under great attack. They are. Um, well, how do you see this playing out on the, from, the, from a biblical perspective? Well, Israel loves Donald Trump. I mean, they love him. Um, the, t the Moving the embassy to Jerusalem from Tel Aviv was huge. Um, there are some in Israel in Amir's far better auth um, authority on this than I am. There are some in Israel who believe Donald Trump, because he's a builder, he's going to build them the third temple. Now, you know, that's, that's probably nonsense, but who knows? I mean, stranger things have been known to happen. <laughs> Uh, they've got Donald Trump on a coin, a coin with King Cyrus. I've seen the coin. On the other side, yeah. yeah it's, and on the back side is an image of, of the next, the coming temple. So we're back to that temple talk again. So it's just a unique relationship. Trump and Netanyahu were friends bef long, long before this. Lifelong yeah, long, long time friends. Um, I believe Donald Trump is probably the greatest president friend Israel has ever had, and I, I, I know Amir would second that. Um, when Harry Truman voted back on May 14th, 1948, with the United Nations, yes, Israel should become a nation. May 14th, he was one, I think he was the first, and he signed that paper, and mm -hmm. then he said, I am Cyrus. So the idea of a president being equivalent to Cyrus something? has been going on for 70 years. Now Donald Trump comes along and they're comparing him. Remember, Cyrus allowed the Jews to come back from the Babylonian exile and build their temple. So that's why some of these presidents, Harry Truman thought he could be Cyrus equivalent. And now, anyway, that's a long answer to your question, Jack, but it's a unique relationship. Yeah, the relationship between America and Israel is unique. Harry Truman did a brave thing back yes. in 1948. He was being pressured by his cabinet people. Don't do this. Don't go along with this foolish, independent nation of Israel. And Truman said, nuts to all of you. I'm going, I'm going along with this. This is the right thing to do. And so... He started the trend. Obviously, we know a lot of them came along in, in between. Some were good, some were bad. And then comes Donald Trump. And 
Um, he did the second most courageous thing, and that is move that embassy to Jerusalem. And that is no small thing when you think of all the men who said, I'm going to do it, uh, never got around to it. One other nation moved their, uh, decided today to move their embassy to yeah. Jerusalem. Uh, Honduras. Honduras. Was that Honduras? Yes. Yeah. Hey, um, one of, uh, Tony Perkins. He'll never say this publicly, but uh, Tony has been Trump's envoy to these nations that are open to relocating the embassy. Trump has had Tony flying all over the globe. Yeah, Michelle Bachman as well. Bachman. She's, she's a very good friend of mine, and she's been literally around That's the right. world in doing this. Isn't this fantastic? Isn't this amazing? You say, yeah, but, yeah, but it's leading to an, an end. You know, I understand that, but the, the Lord says, I'll bless those who bless, bless Israel. And so... You folks know why you're blessed? You bless Israel. Israel, right? We love Israel. Right. I, mean, I mean, we love the word of God, yeah. and in that is the support of Israel. Yeah. Genesis 12, 3. So Genesis, a promise of blessing or cursing yep. of, of, of the nation, of the ministry, of the president, of the ministry leader, of the pastor, of the denomination. If they bless or they curse, there are some blessings or some consequences. One of the reasons you are blessed, I have no question at all, is that you have stood with Israel. It's so absolutely. important. It's so yeah, important. Absolutely. You guys, are you serious? There's no questions? Anybody have a question? I've never seen this happen before. Well, you gotta go to the microphone. One question that's been kind of um, actually consistently in my mind a lot lately is a lot of, um, half of my family is either Christian, but the other half, unfortunately, is really, really hardcore Catholic. And I've been still trying to go Away, and just out of my way to talk to them about, you know, my understanding of, of the gospel and the Bible and how they interpret it. And of course, you know, the differences always come out, you know, well, I have my Bible, this is right, you know, they have the, um, the Catholic Bible, we have the, the Christian Bible. My main question is, how do I approach them? Because I've done it already, but the problem is, it's always usually hostile or it ends in, you know, a really bad, nasty argument. And I try to go about it as cordially as I possibly can. Mm -hmm. The problem is, is they will believe what they believe in, and that there's nothing yeah. else to it. Yeah. And I want to help them so much, but there's only so much I can do and say and act yeah. before they just, just say, no, I've had enough. Number one, pray a lot for them, as I know you are. Simple, here's a simple answer, and I'm, I'm not belittling, belittling this. It's a simple answer. But take their Catholic Bible, take their Catholic Bible, turn to John chapter 3, and have them or you read it out loud to them. Okay, And in their Catholic Bible, in John chapter 3, they're going to hear Jesus say to Nicodemus, you must be born again. And then ask your Catholic family member, have you ever heard that from your priest? If Jesus said you must, then why haven't you heard it? And you don't need to go any further than that. You can walk away, and the Holy Spirit will go to work. Guaranteed. Isaiah 55, 11, my word will not return to me void. I want to encourage you guys to not ask me questions. You have Jan Markell in the flesh right here. Hi, how are you guys doing today? God bless you both. Um, I had a question as regards to uh, the temple and those things you were talking about as far as them getting it ready. There's two things that I see that could be a big hindrance to uh, the coming of the temple. One is the Ark of the Covenant. We still don't know where that's at. And the other is regards to the Levites themselves. How do we know... Uh, who is a Levite and who isn't as far as the bloodline goes because as far as I know mm -hmm. the only ones who can touch the Ark of the Covenant are the, 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 the Levites mm -hmm. so how do we get past that huge obstacle in my opinion that would prevent these kind of things from happening great question well Amir would have to do with the Levite issue but you're right the Ark of the Covenant is a fascinating issue mm -hmm. I totally agree with you and I don't know that we know where it is there are many who think the ark is under, somewhere underground, un hidden away in some secret closet that happened obviously in 70 AD. 
with the destruction of the temple. It would have to be buried very deep, but it could be down, down there safely. Some say the Jews know where it is under there. Mm -hmm. Others say that it's uh, in Ethiopia. Um, I, I, some say the ark is in heaven. And so I, I think the whole Indiana Jones, uh, that was what made him famous. He was looking for the Ark of the Covenant. All right, it's an intriguing, it was such an intriguing concept. Millions around the world got intrigued with this film. Silly film, maybe, but they're lo looking for something that's legitimately missing. So where is it? And can they really have a temple without that Ark of the Covenant? And does it then have to be found first before that temple? And therefore, is it just perhaps hidden away and will be brought out? These are all good questions. I don't think we have an answer. I'd like to add this, and it's just my opinion. Don't underestimate the warning from Paul the Apostle that says that when the wicked one is revealed, and remember, when the wicked one is revealed, it's at, it's at the front end of the seven years. It's not the middle part. Mm -hmm. He's the one, according to Daniel 9, 24 to 27, yeah. crafts the seven-year treaty. Yeah, exactly. Okay, watch this. It says that with all lying signs and wonders, he will deceive the world. You can't even begin to imagine what that means. And then it says, the scripture says that because that generation did not want to believe in the love of the truth, God will send them strong delusion so that they will believe the lie. Could it be that this Antichrist and his team don't have to find the Ark of the Covenant. They can fake Possible. it. Possible. Possible. And you say, no, no, you know, there's good supernatural powers to it. Well, no, it's not. But I know that no Jew is going to go for an Ark that doesn't glow in the dark. I just made that up. <laughs> no Jew is going to go for an Ark that doesn't glow in the dark. It's going to have to be supernatural about it. Remember when the Lord entered the temple, when Solomon's day and the, and the glory of the Lord came out? Yeah. Some demonic manifestation of light is going to happen. And then, uh, you know, so you say, I don't see how it's going to happen. Of course you can. Thank God you can't. But somehow, the great deception is going to be some sort of bamboozlement that your mind has never even imagined. Yeah. And that's what's going to make him so fantastic. Yeah, that's really good, Jack. I right? think you're dead right yeah. on. The Jim. Lord, well, how did that go again? The Lord, <laughs> oh, I'll, it was the inspiration it for was. the moment. It's gone. <laughs> One of your best lines ever, Jack. I've ever heard of you. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Jan, yeah. could you please tell me what seal are we in in the, in the book of Revelation? Say, say again, what, what? The book of Revelation, what seal are we in? What, oh, what seal? Yes. Oh, thank God. What seal we're in now? Mm -hmm. Well, the seals are... Uh, we, we don't participate in the seals. The seals are the... Terrible, terrible outpouring of um, you know, un unspeakable atrocities that are going on during yeah. the tribulation. This is what the church escapes. The church, exactly. see, the church, Jesus addresses the church in the first three chapters of Revelation the church of Sardis, the church of Ethio <laughs> Ethiopia, the church of Philadelphia, yes. uh, the, the various churches. He's scolding some, he's giving uh, praise to some churches. That's in Revelation chapter 3. In cha chapter 4, the church is it's mysteriously four, gone. One. Well, where is it? Well, it's in heaven. That's where it is. God's taken it. Because in Revelation 3.10, he's going to spare the church. He's talking to the churches there. I'm going to spare you from the wrath to come. And the wrath would be the seals, the bulls, yeah. the vials, the judgments that are coming. We have nothing to do with remember, them. Nothing. And, and remember this. Uh, sure, did you guys hear a question? Yeah? Very important question. Um, the, the first 1,260 days of the seven-year tribulation period are days of never-before-seen peace and prosperity in the earth. You got to remember that. The Bible says the Antichrist deceives people by peace and prosperity. Where was that? When did that happen? Okay? And the next thing is, the last 1,260 days is what's known as the time of wrath, where it's violence. 
That's what she's referring to. What seal are we in? Yeah. The Bible reveals that the last 1,260 days of the three and a half years, uh, of the seven years, seven years, is a time of seal judgments. Yeah. Anybody know how many there are? Seven. seven. And then the seventh seal opens up trumpets. How many trumpet judgments? Seven. And at the last trumpet, the seventh trumpet, opens up the bowl judgments. Every one of those have supernatural manifestations on earth. So the, the question is, we are not in any of the seal, t uh, trumpet, or bold judgments because the Antichrist has not been revealed. How do we know? Because there's not a seven-year peace treaty with Israel. Neither is there one man, a globalist, who is swooning the world with his peace and prosperity uh, tactics. Are you with me? So that's a good thing to remember. Thank you. Very good thing to remember. Yes, thank you, Jack. That was excellent. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, um, awesome stuff tonight. Um, I guess I just wanted to ask about something a bit more recent um, for either of you if you want to chime in, but how would you view um, Trump's decision to pull the troops out of Syria in light thank of Ezekiel you. 38? That was one of my 10 that we, had, we hadn't gotten to yet. Thank and you. It's huge. I, I'll give my opinion, Jack. Please follow sure. up. But, it's, I think it's huge now. I, I know he's waffling a little bit, and, and now he's going to do it over four months, so it's not instant. And first, of, first, I just want to state that I am concerned for those in that region that if he does go through with this, which it sounds like he will, there are going to be some vulnerable people, starting with the Christians who are left, who haven't been so haven't been slaughtered yet, uh, they're going to be extremely vulnerable. The Kurds could be annihilated because Turkey is not going to protect the Kurds. The Kurds are very moderate Muslims. They, they're mm -hmm. West-loving Muslims. Um, they're just kind of a, a different breed of Muslim, and yes. they're our allies. They are our they're friends. good people. Yeah, good people. Um, so those two are going to be marginalized in some smaller groups, perhaps the Yazidis, etc. So I'm very concerned. Enough of the torment of people in that part of the country. Let's go right directly to your question. Uh, how might it play in? And, and Jack, I know you would agree that a, a perfect land bridge is now available for Iran. Iran, Russia, Turkey will be the three primary players that are going to have open season in Syria without US troops there. Now Israel will be aggressive. And Israel will do what she can to put out those fires. Mm -hmm. But I see a perfect opportunity and land bridge now open with U.S. troops out. And speeding, in other words, Gog, Magog, Ezekiel 38, 39, is absolutely, if this goes through, um, yeah, I believe it could happen imminently once that is official. God's word tells us that we need to be like the sons of Ishakar who yes. knew and understood the times of Israel and what the people should do. Okay, so what do we, I'll tell you what I do not believe. I do not believe that Donald Trump turned to Ezekiel. Right. And over to Isaiah 17 and said, you know what? The Bible in the last days, in, the, in that Ezekiel battle, there is no Syria. It doesn't exist. It's not listed. So I'm gonna pull out our troops and let it be annihilated because it's really not even a nation right now. Do you know that? Syria is occupied by Russia and Iran. And so we know that the Ezekiel, thank you for bringing that question up, and then in the nations listed that come against Israel in that coalition of Islamic nations, Syria is not even mentioned. Damascus is even mentioned. How come? Isaiah 17. Damascus is never, something's gonna happen in Damascus and it's never again gonna be inhabited. So I don't think Trump's, is going, Trump's looking to say, oh my gosh. We got to pull Trump. We have to pull troops out of Syria. I don't think so. Either A, God is moving Trump to pull troops out of Syria because God knows his word. B, that Trump is somehow surrendering to Putin and Erdogan. Ain't going to happen. Or C, it's possible. Or D, it's possible. But C is what's being rumored about on the dark web is, in fact, today, Trump said 
Trump said, I'm pulling troops out of Syria and go, wa go watch it. I'm pulling, Trump's, I, I'm, I'm pulling troops out of Syria, uh, but we are really gonna let them have it. Go listen for that. Did you hear that? It's like, what are you saying? In the dark world of special ops and CIA speculation, there's a rumor going around that Trump is getting all U.S. forces out by design because he's done with it. He's done with what's going on and that he's going to, and you need to, you need to watch this. I'm not saying it's going to happen. I'm not saying it's not going to happen. That he is, that he's put the word out to uh, private armies, global private armies to go into Syria. Why? Global, like Blackwater, like uh, Triple Canopy, others. Why? Because they don't have to fight by any Geneva Convention or national rules. If the United States or Russia wants to do something that's, off the, that's, that's not allowed, did you know this, everybody? Hey, wake up, it's the way it works. If we can't deal with this situation in China because the Geneva Convention doesn't allow it or our Constitution doesn't allow it, we will hire a private army that is made up of international special operators and they conduct operations and they answer to no one. And if you think this is news, this has been happening since the late 60s. That's being very much talked about right now. Now look, I have, I'll say a name right now and I, don't, I cannot endorse his language. He's not a Christian, he says he is, but a Christian cannot cuss like he does. But many of you are familiar and I highly recommend his podcast if you can handle it. It's not for the faint of heart and it's not for gentle ears and that's Brian Suits. Uh, that guy knows stuff and he himself is a former SEAL. I think it's, anybody know Brian Suits? SEAL, Delta Force, what is he? Special operator. Period, he's one of those things. So. But Jack brought up um, Isaiah 17, one and that's the annihilation of Damascus. Yes. And Damascus is huge. I mean, could it compare with L.A.? I mean, it could be comparable. Maybe not quite as big, but just, it's, it's enormous. And what could cause the utter devastation of a city, certainly the size of the Twin Cities, where I come from, which is huge, what could cause that entire devastation of a city like that? Is it chemical weapons underground? Who knows? It could be um, Saddam Hussein's chemical weapons um, buried. We don't know. Uh, there are many who say that, that that could be the case. But something is going to cause the utter... I mean, there's destruction in Damascus now, but there are millions of people living there and enjoying Friday night in the local um, eateries. I mean, they're, they're enjoying life in Damascus. It's all going to come to an end in an instant. We don't know when. We don't know how. What's weird about it is right now it's because of ISIS and its earlier exploits of Damascus. There's, there's fewer, the fewest known. This is the first time in, over, in 2,000 years that Damascus has had the smallest Christian population. Did you know that? Because of ISIS. ISIS killed them all or, they, or Christians fled to Europe. Fled, yeah. What if, what if God even used ISIS to get the Christians out of Syria before wrath falls because Damascus is going to go up and the United States government hired the Israeli Air Force to take photographs of Saddam Hussein moving his chemical That's and biological right. weapons out of Iraq into the city of Damascus and Saddam Hussein paid Bashar Assad hundreds of millions of dollars to receive their cachet of weapons because they knew that General Schwarzkopf was coming. Did you know that? Yeah, you do. You know that. Because the photographs taken by right. the 109 squadron in Israel was paid for by the United States State Department. And this could happen tomorrow, folks. 
This doesn't have to wait till the tribulation. This could happen tomorrow. You could find this that's in headlines right. tomorrow. There's it's, nothing that says this is a tribulation event. This could right. be in headlines tomorrow. And if it was, I mean, believe me, that is a huge red sign, red flag that's being right. waved. That's a, there's not a precursory requirement for Isaiah 17 or Ezekiel. Some, I personally believe, this is my opinion, probably wrong. I believe Isaiah 17, 1 happens before Ezekiel. Yes, I would agree. Why? Because Syria is not mentioned in the Ezekiel nations coming. Something happens to it. By the way, what if something, what if, what if Damascus does go up in smoke? Who's going to get blamed for it? Um, Israel. It's pro and Israel will probably do it. I mean, I think, well, <laughs> yeah, very. Well, she'll be doing it to defend herself. True. She'll be doing it to defend herself uh, because she'll know that something has been ta is taking place, something is being coordinated in, in Damascus that to cause her annihilation, and she'll have to yeah. strike preemptively. So I'm quite sure it would be Israel that would do this. I uh, can't imagine who else. But again, there's evil forces over there. you got the Russians, but I don't think they're going to turn on Bashar Assad, their allies. Yeah. you got the Turks. I don't think they have the capability to do this. Israel certainly has the capability to do it in a nanosecond. For Pete's sakes, they can uh, take a couple of jets and, and everything's history. Israel doesn't even need a jet to yeah. do it. All they need is an iPhone. True. Israel can destroy Damascus yeah. with pressing send on a phone. From inside, they, they can do it. They can call Damascus and take care of it then, there, That's electronically. Right. It's unbelievable. That's right. Absolute, by the way, with Trump as president and Netanyahu as president, uh, prime minister, Israel has shared tremendous technologies with the United States. You should, no, no, Pastor, you got, that, you got that wrong, right? We share technologies with them. No, they have shared technologies with us because Netanyahu and Trump are good friends. Wow. Yes. You were talking about the one world uh, government um, the global um, getting together and what stands in the way is America and Donald Trump. I'd like if you could talk a little bit about his enemies, people like the Federal Reserve and Trilateral Commission. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I have a, and I don't want to be here talking about what I, my products and all. I did a teaching a couple of years ago. I have it on DVD. It's just called Hidden in Plain View the New World Order and Bible Prophecy. And uh, the New World Order, you know, they can sound conspiratorial. It happens to be a reality. And again, it's this rush to the one, uh, to the one world system. And it's the Antichrist system. And it started with Nimrod 5,000 right. years ago and goes right up through um, the Knights Templar, Amir and I have a message that's very similar, and we didn't even know each other had created it. You get the Knights Templar, you get the Masons, you can go right up through Council on Foreign Relations. Um, some men who pushed back against the New World Order and what happened to them mysteriously. Something. Happened. I, I don't. I don't want to sound like a conspiracy theorist, but when the conspiracy is in the Bible, then I think it's okay to talk about it. And the conspiracy is just to get the Antichrist installed. That's all it is. But they've been trying to do it for five thousand years, and now we're up to some of the present players. George Soros, number one. Um, Soros has a son, I believe, who's being groomed to succeed him. Um, again, the Rockefeller family, the Rothschild family, none of this. I, I'm, not, I'm not saying anything. This is history, okay? This is just history. Uh, I think the question is, and every time I say this, some on YouTube go crazy when I say, some of these people don't know that the, the kingdom they're trying to install. Sure. Did the Rockefellers think... We're planning Antichrist's empire. I doubt it. Mm. I think others know that. Others, other players know who they're trying to install. I think some know it and some don't know That's it. Right. But the point is, an empire has been trying, the Antichrist empire is trying to be installed for the last 5,000 years. And you know what? They're going to have seven ignominious years. That's all. Seven years. They've tried for 5,000 years and they're going to get seven years, and look what uh, a hellhole 
it's going to be of seven years. So congratulations, guys. Yeah, yeah.